Okay, great. Let's get started as people still are joining. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, I am uh, Sarah Harvey, Content Marketing Manager here at Platform SH, um, and we are hosting a quick webinar with Corey. It will be about an hour long. Um, it's got great useful information. I'm excited that you're here. Um, just some a few notes. You're welcome to use the chat feature to talk with folks during the webinar. If you will put all and any questions in the Q&A box, we will get to those at the end of the webinar. Um, I would also like to note that this webinar is being recorded. So we will share the link with you uh, after the webinar and you'll be able to uh, view it live on demand. But that is it for me, Corey, you can, you can take it and run with it. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Um, happy Wednesday. Uh, looking forward to talking to you a little bit more about maximizing efficiency um, strategies for application optimization today. Um, as Sarah stated, uh, my, my name is Corey Dockendorf. I'm a strategic solutions architect here at Platform SH. Um, I've been with the company for a few years now. I uh, have almost 20 years of experience in technology and the business. Um, so yeah, I've seen I've seen it all. I've seen everything from you know managed services to uh, cloud computing all the way down to working on slot machines inside of a casino. But that's another story for another day. Um, but yes, so Sarah's going to join me. She's going to hang out in the background, um, and we can just dive right into this and see how uh, everything goes. Like she said, hold your questions until the end or put them in the chat, and we can go from there. So let's dive in. One, maximizing optimization efficiency. Why do we even care? In today's world, web applications are the backbone of many, many businesses, especially um, in this uh, post-COVID world, everything is online these days. So serving this as primary um, interface and interaction with customers, executing transactions, delivering services, right? Everything is online these days. As such, the performance of these applications can significantly impact user experience, user engagement, and ultimately business success. Uh, everyone with a web application day should have at least these three topics in mind, right? User experience, SEO ranking, and resource usage. User experience. In this era where users expect lightning fast responses, right? We have um, people that have the attention span of anything more than three seconds and they're out. They've checked out. So if your website or your application is taking longer than that, uh, most of the time they've clicked off, closed the window, or moved on to something else. So even the slightest delay can lead to frustration on your client side and reduce satisfaction and a higher likelihood of abandoning the application altogether, right? So what we want is a faster, uh, quicker user experience to make sure that they're getting the content and the things that they need uh, when they need it lightning fast. Your SEO ranking, search engines actually favor uh, fast loading websites, right? Making optimization a critical factor for improving search visibility and attracting actual organic traffic. And then resource usage. We like to look at this as an operational efficiency. Optimized applications use resources more effectively, right? Reducing your operational costs and improving the scalability to handle growth and peak demand periods, right? So let's take a look at your actual client and what they're doing and how they're being affected today, right? So this, this is your, these are your users, this is your client, and this is your client trying to get to your application. The goal here is to make this process as quick as possible, right? Looking at this image, you'll notice that the each layer of the request has some sort of caching that can be engaged to or optimizing the user uh, experience, right? We're gonna dive into a couple of these uh, layers and see how uh, some of them may help your team uh, optimize your application all the way throughout this process. Caching is a common uh, technique here that, that can pretty much enhance system performance and reduce response time. From the front end to the back end, caching plays a crucial role in improving the efficiency of various applications and systems. As you can see in this diagram here, in these specific ones, we have at the edge layer at the web page, we can see at the application layer with the database, we can see directly on the user's local browser, right? So with all of these different strategies and mechanisms for this caching data, depending on your requirements and constraints, you may implement all of these, you may implement some of these, but we're gonna go through some of them and you guys can uh, pick and choose as you go along. Now, again, not gonna go through every single option, but I am going to try and provide a few common options you can do to enhance your site's performance. So let's start with browser caching, right? Browser caching is a powerful performance optimization technique that stores copies of resources, such as HTML files, uh, style sheets, JavaScript files, you know, images in your local cache of a user's, in the local cache of a user's browser. 
this strategy significantly impacts the efficiency and speed of web applications by reducing the load on, on your origin server and decreasing the time it takes for pages to load for the user. Um, we see this all the time that, you know, users, uh, what is the first thing anybody tells you to do when you're trying to get to a web page? Have you cleared your browser cache? Have you cleared your browser cache? So this is very important because this is where the user's directly interacting to the web browser to see exactly what your site is doing, making this more um, relevant to the client um, and their local machine. Browser caching. So once the browser, how does this work? Once the browser has requested the data directly from the server, it stores it into a folder created by that browser, right? The next time the client opens that web page, it won't make a call directly to your server for that data. It actually will pull it uh, from the browser cache folder. Now, there are a couple um, variables that you don't, don't have control over, right? That is what browser the client is using, right? Their internet speed, their latency speed. But what we can do is implement certain features to make sure that those don't affect the customer's experience, right? We want to we want to reduce those as much as possible, right? We can control certain aspects of it, but the other ones are based off of, you know, again, latency. You can only do so much with that, but you can make it so that that experience is much faster and much quicker. So how do we accomplish this with browser caching? Typically by leveraging HTTP headers, right? Using HTTP caching. Um, this can easily be done um, and it's flexibly controlled uh, directly by your application, right? Using these HTTP header directives, um, uh, you can handle specific HTTP requests. So some of the key benefits of uh, using browser caching, uh, instant resource loading, right? When a user visits a website, resources can lo be loaded from the local web browser cache, right? So rather than being downloaded again from the server, making the round trip back and forth, this drastically reduces those load times, delivering a faster and more seamless browsing experience bandwidth consumption, right? In this day and age, we always wanna make sure that we keep our bandwidth costs low. Well, by serving resources from the local cache, the amount of data transferred between the server and the client is reduced. So lowering bandwidth usage on server load. This is particularly beneficial of websites with really high traffic volumes or spiky traffic volumes or limited bandwidth. Reducing your hosting costs we had talked about previously, right? Lowering bandwidth usage translates into cost savings for website owners, especially uh, those with high traffic. Right. This also means that we don't have to worry about using the uh, server resources as much, right? Uh, optimizing the existing resources so that you can delay or minimize the investments in additional server capacity or infrastructure upgrades. So um, an example of this is if you were to use something like um, Nginx, right? So you're using Nginx uh, location directives, you can set um, a cache control of a max age of, we'll say, 365 days. And then we could define this as a public and add this as a header clause into your configuration, really making this really easy to configure for uh, your user. So now, this all sounds great. This sounds pretty easy to implement, but the question is how do you use HTTP caching? Like how do you implement it? I just give you an example by setting max age and using public. Well, that's a couple headers that we can leverage within all of this. So with that, let's talk about HTTP caching. So. HTTP headers, which are used in HTTP caching, are used to control the caching behavior of the web resources, guiding both browsers and intermediate caches, just like CDN edges, on how to handle caching of the web content. Uh, an HTTP header is used to specify caching policies for these resources, which can be done in a number of ways, right? There's cache control, there's expires, a um, couple of them, e tags, last modified, uh, I believe uh, very is another one that uh, we see people using. Origin servers can communicate their caching instructions to downstream caching proxies by adding this cache control header to their responses. Origin, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and HTTP header values known as directives, directives <laughs> are defined within the header specification and have various uses. Uh, we see developers primarily using these directives to convey caching instructions. I just see them as we are instructing what the HTTP header is going to do. So I love that they call them directives. It always makes me think of Star Trek and the prime directive, but in the end it's, they're just instructions on what we're supposed to do when these requests come in. So why would I want to implement this, right? We go back to performance, bandwidth, saving, and control, right? Uh, we are with control, we're at least ensuring that users are seeing up-to-date content all the time, right? Again, with the bandwidth savings, like we talked about, having this involved, you're determining exactly what you're caching, what you're not caching, and how much is being transferred between that and the origin server. So that's really a lot of the benefits that we see with HTTP caching. Um, 
And sometimes, sometimes these work well together. Sometimes you don't want to mix these, right? We don't want to do, um, you know, not caching content, caching a bunch of content and then mixing back and forth uh, and getting more convoluted than needs to be. We want to try and make this as simple as possible. Um, here at Platform uh, SH and actually uh, at Upsun as well, our HTTP cache headers are actually enabled by default. Um, so you have the ability to quickly control and decide which directives you want to use and implement uh, naturally, right? You don't, there's not a lot of a previous setup, a lot of control. All of that can be done within your application and your container uh, fairly simply. So as noted with those few options that we can use, I want to drill down specifically into cache control, you know, specifically in the uh, directives that are available there as they seem to be the most common, honestly. So cache control directives. So a, a few of the ones that we see that are more used in today, we see public, private, no cache, no store, max age in seconds, and must revalidate. So cache control itself is, this is the primary header, right? Cache control is the primary header. As you see on the left-hand side of this example, where I have cache control set at max age, 315, 36, that, that's, that's exactly 365 days is what that is. So with cache control, we see this primary header controlling that cache behavior and we would assign it a specific directive. So in this instance, we're using max age. A few of these key, direct, key directives that I have on the right, we can kind of look at and see how we can use them and what would be most beneficial and who would use these things. So let's start with public. Public, these uh, directives can be cached even in the case where it's associated with an HTTP authentication or the HTTP response status code is not cacheable, typically, right? In most cases, the response is not necessary uh, because explicit caching information, right? If we're doing something like max age, uh, shows that a response is capable anyway. So this is just your general, you don't have to specifically tag anything like this. It's just nice. It's just pretty much explaining what public caching would be from there. Private caching, however, now that's a response marked as private can be cached by the client browser, but these responses are intended for single users, right? They aren't cacheable by intermediate caches. So nothing at the HTML pages, or we're not doing uh, HTML pages or private user info. Uh, these can be cached by a user's browser, but not by a CDN, right? So we can identify who is actually gonna be caching that info. Is it local? Great, CDN doesn't touch it. These next ones, the next four, actually are very specific to what your application may or may not be doing. Right. So these are things that uh, a lot of users we see, depending on um, what vertical that they're in, whether it's healthcare or um, finance, may want to use these features for certain benefits. Right. No cache. No cache. This indicates that the response that's received can be stored in the cache, but must be validated with the origin server before it reach reuse. What does that mean? That means that it's going to be more round trips back and forth to origin. If the data has changed for any reason, uh, but ensuring that the information is provided is fresh and up to date. Well, why would you want to do that? We just talked about bandwidth costs. Well, let's take a look at, for example, a bank website, right? A bank website that wants to ensure that the customer is always seeing the most current account information when they view their balance or recent transactions. To achieve this, the bank can set the cash control no cash header for the account balance and transaction pages. This directive instructs the browser and anything else, whether it's CDN or anything along those lines, again, those intermediate caches, to revalidate the content with the server before serving it to the user. This means that every time the user checks their balance or transaction history, the browser must reach back, contact the server to confirm if the displayed information is up to date. And then if the server confirms that the content has not changed, it can then respond with a 304 not modified status, avoiding the need to resend the data but still ensuring the user sees the most recent information. Obviously, this is one of those directives that we're not gonna to wanna to use all over the sites. And it's gonna be very specific on what pages uh, and how you wanna use it. So next, let's look at no store. No store prevents caching of sensitive information, no matter public or private, right? We don't want the response stored in any cache whatsoever. Great. Well, why would we wanna do that? Well, let's use a healthcare portal, for example, right? Specifically when viewing sensitive personal information, so again, PHI data, or conducting transactions like updating medical records or submitting insurance claims. In that context, the healthcare portal wants to ensure the utmost privacy and security of user data to prevent any sensitive information from being stored in the browser cache or intermediary caches, such as you know, those used by ISPs or internal corporate networks. The portal can set the cache control no store header, no store header for pages containing or processing PHI data. This directive instructs all types of caches that they must not store any part of the request or response. 
This approach is particularly important for shared or public computers, right? Where multiple users might have access to the same device. By using NoStore, the healthcare portal helps protect users' sensitive information from unauthorized access. So we can see there, right, NoStore, how that's leveraging, especially in that type of uh, field. And with PHI and personal data being very large uh, within, the, uh, within the world today, we wanna make sure what, that we're caching everything properly. Let's use max age. Now, I showed you uh, in this image, right, you know, max age, 365, you know, it's gonna expire every year. That's awesome. But with max age, freshness lifetime, freshness is the lifetime of the resource is what we want. You know, to avoid breaking the specifications here, uh, it is recommended we typically don't think, uh, don't set your value for more than a year, right? That's just the best practice. Uh, don't set it for two years, three years, things change, right? So we really want the freshness of that site all the time of those resources. So we want it to expire at a certain extent. Here would be something like um, a news website, right? A news website uh, where content is frequently updated, but certain types of information such as certain articles or news stories remain relevant for a specific period in time. So for instance, an, uh, a news website might have, we'll say like uh, the New York Times or something along those lines, might have a section for daily news articles. The site, then uh, the developers can say, hey, you know, that article in the section would be considered fresh for about two hours, right? After the publication, a new article or pu uh, are published and existing ones are updated within the same time frame. Uh, so with by implementing this caching strategy, we basically would set the cache control max age to, what is two hours, 7,200 uh, seconds. And that would be on um, those HTTP headers for those articles. So at the end of those, it would cycle and go back and make sure that there were any changes or any updates from there. So this directive tells that browsers uh, that they can serve that cache version of the article without having to revalidate up to two hours. That's great. Or up to a year, as we see with the cache control directive. You can see the uh, Google actually has a, several sites that actually do a year configuration as well. So after this period, after the two hour period of setting everything up, any request for the article must go all the way back to the server and then check and validate that there is a newer version or not a newer version. And then finally, must revalidate. Must revalidate. When the cache is expired, this web server sends a request to your application with a header to say what's changed. This is called an if modified sense header. Uh, so where, where would we put something like this in, right? So we can use Ticketmaster or online ticket booking uh, systems for events or transportation, right? Lane, <laughs> like trains, uh, planes, and automobiles. Uh, there we have the avail availability of like seats constantly changing, right? Now we're looking at like Southwest and America Airlines and you're like, well, I wanna see, you know, when's the availability? When am I getting the seat? Is it available? Can I sit next to my spouse, et cetera? In such a system, it's crucial that users see most uh, current availability to avoid overbooking, right? Or selecting seats that are no longer available. However, to improve performance and reduce server load, the system might still cache seat in, uh, availability information for a very, very short period. Setting the cache control must revalidate header. The booking system instructs caches that once the cache, uh, cache data has reached the maximum age and therefore considered stale, uh, it must not be used again without revalidating with the origin server. This ensures that users can still benefit from caching for quick access to data, but as soon as they proceed to book a seat or when the cache expires, the system checks with the server to present the most up-to-date seat availability. Each of these headers that we've just gone through, there are, there are several more, but each of the headers that we just went through play a crucial role in the caching strategy of specific kinds of websites influencing load times, server loads, and the freshness of the content presented by the user. So that here is cache control directives. Um, but now that we've looked at this and looked at cache control, let's move a little bit more to the edge of the web page and discuss leveraging something along the lines like a CDN or a content delivery network. So CDNs are great. Why? <laughs> They're a globally distributed network of caches, right? Serving the content as close to your user as possible. Again, having to go, having a user sitting in Australia trying to go to a site that's a station in Oregon can yeah, take a while. Again, that latency and that uh, um, that variable of how fast uh, that network looks like. This is neat because it means that we don't have to ask the server for anything because we're caching everything at the CDN. Most modern edge layers um, actually can even do more than just this nowadays. Like uh, they can do automatic, uh, automatically optimized images for you um, so that mobile clients get smaller files or smaller file sizes can create quicker transfers, et cetera. 
So CDN, with these networks served strategically distributed across various locations globally, are designed to deliver web content and pages to users based on their specific geographic location, right? We call these uh, POPs or points of presence. CDNs generally offer the best performance as they're not, they're the only option that includes multiple geographic locations. So again, putting that something like that here makes the most sense because now we have a broader audience. We have a worldwide audience. Um, I've got people all over the world. I don't want them to come into my server here in Oregon or Texas or wherever you're stationed, right? We can reduce that latency, latency from customers, right? So again, that was the topic that we talked about at the beginning is the latency and trying to figure out how fast they're able to get to that content. By serving that content from the nearest server to the user, CDN significantly reduced that latency and improved those load times because now I'm not having to travel all the way back to my origin. Scalability is another feature here, right? CDNs can handle spikes of traffic by distributing that load across multiple servers, ensuring consistent performance uh, even under heavy load. And then security, right? And everybody needs to be worried about security at some point or another. Well, they can also provide added security layers, including DDoS protection and traffic encryption these days, basically safeguarding your application against common web threats. Here at Platform and Upson, we actually uh, integrate these without you having to maintain anything. Uh, we provide um, a CDN uh, a, as well uh, with Fastly uh, directly to you guys, and we actually can help manage that for you guys. So in a world where people are on so many different devices, however, you know, having a CDN is great, but now we're all attached to either, a, it's either a phone, a laptop, a desktop, a uh, tablet, a smart fridge. <laughs> now you have to consider how you share your images and your content through the CDN to each one of those pieces of tech, right? Now I'm taking a picture and I'm gonna send it to a phone. So I gotta send a small one there. I'm sending it to a laptop. That's a specific size. Now I gotta send one to the tablet. Well, that's a little bit smaller than a laptop, but it's a little bit bigger than a phone, right? So how do we leverage that and uh, make these pictures faster so that Globally, everybody can access this, and depending on the uh, type of media that you're using, it doesn't matter, right? You're being you're going to be able to get the fastest experience possible. So there's another tool that you can do uh, that you can use uh, along those lines uh, that actually provides us the ability to manage those assets, and those are usually called image optimizers. So image optimization is the real time uh, image transformation and optimization service that caches and serves uh, pixel optimized bandwidth efficient images requested from your origin server, right? So it's neat because um, images can be resized. They can see their quality readjusted, cropped, cut. Um, their orientation can be flipped uh, and changed and their format can be converted. Uh, this gives you, and this is all done through this single um, optimized uh, tool, right? So this allows you to serve images faster, uh, diminishing your page load times while, when they hold many, many images, right? Um, outbound diminished costs by putting more cash at the edge, right? Allowing you to reduce origin solicitation and back and forths, uh, diminishing your storage costs because you only need to keep one original picture and let the image optimizer take it and form it at the CDN and then present that directly to your uh, clients. And the diminishing of your development environment, uh, de development effort. Uh, since you don't need any specific library anymore to manipulate your images. So now you're not doing anything uh, like that at your application, everything's happening at the edge. So a perfect example is, you know, there's a, so you take an image uh, and it's cached once, right, at the edge. Um, if dis distinct requests might demand a specific version of that image, they can be transformed differently. So let's go an example. So for example, you have, you're on your desktop device, right? And you go to look at a meme for whatever reason. And that image is gonna be an image PMG and it's gonna be about 1600 pixels wide. Okay, that's fine. Now, if I wanted to do the same thing and send this picture to my friend who is actually going to get it on their mobile device because they're out for a run, it now has to convert it and say that it's only gonna be about 400 pixels wide. So the way that that's handled at the image optimization is that these requests are considered to be different for the purpose of caching and they're transformed at that edge and will result in different cached objects. But the request to the origin is only a single image. So it's actually taking it, converting it, changing it, and then presenting it to the specific device without having to worry about doing all of that at the application and making those changes and writing scripts to serve different content and then have multiple different images of different sizes determining to be served. All of that is done at the CDN, right? So that's another powerful tool that if you have a very heavy image site or um, and know that you're gonna have different uh, audiences all over the different um, spectrum of devices, 
this is a good way to save some bandwidth costs, et cetera. So let's take a look what happens during that whole process of what happens when something is not cached at the CDM level, right? And we have to do server-side caching. So server-side caching means that we have to get it from the server itself, right? This is where your application kicks in. Uh, it potentially needs to collect data and assemble some sort of HTML response. Once your application has generated the response once, the web server would hang on to it for a while. So the next time a user requests uh, request it, the web server will not have to go back and ask the application again, right? So one of the ways to accomplish this is by leveraging full page caching. Full page caching is a technique where the entire output of a web page is stored in the cache. When a request is made for a cached page, the server can serve the cached output directly, bypassing the need to execute the PHP scripts again, right? So now we've you know, decreased our page load speed significantly because now cache pages are served without the need to run PHP scripts or query databases, drastically reducing page load times. Uh, uh, results in a faster, more responsive user experiencing, experience, uh, keeping users engaged and reducing bounce rates, right? Back, back to that, you've got about three seconds to capture an audience. We wanna make that load speed as fast as possible. Reducing that server load is going to save you time again on that resource perspective, right? This decreases your CPU and memory usage, allowing the servers to handle more simultaneous requests and reducing the risk of servers uh, overload during uh, traffic spikes. Scalability, right? With uh, When the reduced load of, uh, of on the servers and the resources, your application can scale more efficiently to accommodate increased traffic. PHP full page enables you to serve more users with the same server infrastructure, delaying or eliminating completely the need for costly hardware updated upgrades or increase of CPU and RAM. Lowering hosting costs, right? Efficient resource utilization through caching can lead to lower hosting costs. Since the server can handle more traffic without additional resources, great. You can opt for a less expensive hosting plan or avoid upgrading anything else to one of the bigger ones. And then your SEO performance, like we talked at the beginning of this, of this presentation. Search engines prior to prioritize fast loading websites in their rankings. The speed improvements for PHP full page caching can contribute to better SEO performance, making your site more visible in search results and potentially driving up more organic traffic. Uh, reliability under high traffic, as we talked about less resources. So now we don't have to worry about those spikes and server crashes or slowdowns because we're getting, we want, we want to make sure that high traffic is a good problem to have, but we don't want you to have, be penalized for that. So full page caching um, can be served quickly, efficiently, and ensuring your site remains accessible and responses uh, even under heavy load. Energy efficiency, right? Uh, everything this day is green and making sure that, you know, how are we saving the world? How are we saving the earth? Well, with energy efficiency, by serving a full cage pad, a uh, full paid a cached page, uh, this requires less energy to processing PHP scripts and querying databases for every request, right? By reducing the computational demands on the servers, PHP full page caching contributes to lower energy consumption and a smaller carbon footprint. And then obviously sim simplified content delivery. We're not doing a whole bunch of calls back and forth. We're just sending the whole page, right? This simplifies the process of content delivery. Um, they get the content faster and then there's no no noticeable delay for server processing. So now with all of this, this is highly effective, great for websites with content that doesn't change frequently or for pages uh, where personalized content is minimal, minimal or can be loaded dynamically, right? Via the client side scripts such as JavaScript. Um, however, for pages with highly dynamic and personalized content, you know, those that are changing all the time, page caching might not be suitable as it could serve outdated and incorrect information to users. So there is a caveat to using something along these lines. In such cases, other caching strategies, you know, um, uh, fragment caching, object caching, or even um, not caching at all, like we talked about earlier, might be appropriate. So uh, this can be done, uh, full page caching can be done at several of the layers throughout the client process and the client journey uh, by either you know, web server configurations, so if you're using models like Nginx's cache um, or reverse proxies, uh, so anything like Varnish um, or through previously discussed uh, CDNs, right? All of these uh, technologies and these cachings uh, are actually supported here at Platform SHs and Upsun as well. And we have ample documentation to assist with the configuration and simplicity of these things. So we've gone all the way down to page caching at this point, but now what happens when we can't do a workaround anymore, right? We have reached the point of no return. We have a request that in any other layer before, it cannot be stored, cannot be served, cannot be cached. So we finally have to execute some code that Ideally, you and your developing team have written. 
So now we're caching locally at the application and database layer, right? So let's assume you have written something that works, ideally, that's a good start, <laughs> and then returns the data it needs to the user in question. As a next step, we need to understand in the way we fetch that data and put it together in an efficient uh, manner so that uh, everything is working on the back end uh, seamlessly. And there are a few different data points to look at in that scenario. For example, it's common uh, that runtimes try to store already compiled bytecode so that they don't have to do it again, right? Uh, Python creates a PYC file for this, uh, and PHP leverages um, things like opcache. Uh, for today's discussion, let's use opcache as an example to look a bit deeper. Opcache improves PHP performance by storing pre-compiled script bytecode in shared memory, thereby eliminating the complete need for PHP to load and parse scripts on each request. This mechanism significantly reduces server load and increases processing speed, making an essential optimization tool for any PHP-based web application. From a scalable perspective, Opcache web servers can handle um, more concurrent requests without additional hardware resources, making it easier to scale applications as user, as user demand grows, right? If we're just doing a single piece and we want to have that scalability, we know that we need to make sure that it, if the increase is going to be calling to the server, we want to make sure we're running efficiently. So the scalability is crucial for applications experiencing variable traffic patterns. Compatibility and ease of use, right? Uh, it is also already bundled and enabled by default in PHP. So making it easily accessible for most PHP applications. We're not trying to get a third party. Uh, we're not trying to get, you know, uh, vaporware. We're going to do everything and build it in directly to PHP. Uh, its integration uh, directly into PHP runtime also means that there are no additional dependencies, external services, um, and it makes deploying and maintenance much easier, right? You're only having to worry about one thing rather than multiple. Um, and then back to performance, right? Faster request processing, caching a pre, uh, by caching uh, pre-compiled bytecode and enabling PHP scripts to execute faster, it bypasses the comp uh, compilation step on subsequent requests. This results in quicker response times for end users. And then again, server load. Opcache reduces that workload on the server by minimizing the amount of CPU and disk I.O. required to process those scripts. This efficiency is particularly beneficial during those spikes, right? Configurability and control, Opcache offers a wide range of configuration options, right? That allow developers to tailor caching strategies, specific needs to their applications. So you can get very granular with Opcache and how it's actually managing your uh, systems. This includes settings for uh, things like memory consumption, cache expiration, and even file revalidation frequency locally. Uh, developers can also control with uh, which scripts are cached, right? So either globally or on a per directory basis, providing even more granularity and optimization opportunities. So with all of this, we've now optimized, we've tweaked, we've turned knobs, we've made things all more efficient and made our application faster. But how do we measure that success? How do we know that it's doing? Because I'm not sitting at the client side unless they're going to complain about it. I'm hoping that they're, they're experiencing it as well as I want them to based off of everything I've changed. So how do we gain that insight to optimize and maintain performance after the change we have made? Well, at that point, we would use an APM or an application performance monitoring tool. That's where this comes in. An application performance monitoring tool is used for monitoring and managing the performance and availability of, the, of your application. APMs can help uh, you and your teams understand how applications behave, identify performance bottlenecks and improve user experience uh, and give you a visualization of how that's working and functioning. So that visibility we get, we gain those insights into the application behavior from a front end user experience all the way to the back end database performance, helping identify and troubleshoot issues quickly. Proactive optimization, right? Applicate an APM tool allows to proactively detect um, any potential performance bottlenecks, right? Enabling your teams to address issues before they actually ever get to the user by deploying it on development and staging environments. And then user experience tracking. Monitor and analyze how real users interact with your application, identifying patterns and areas for improvements to enhance overall satisfaction to everybody at the, at, at the client side. Here at Platform SH, we leverage all of our, custom, all of our enterprise level customers with what's called Blackfire IO. Blackfire IO is an application performance monitoring tool and profiler that is uh, included with everything and fully built in, very little setup involved, um, and we support it as well. So 
using Blackfire to give you that visibility into your application and services that support it, um, we can turn uh, and identify any of those bottlenecks and provide live insights from our whole from the whole technical stack, right? Digging down, shedding light on even minor issues that are still causing degrading user experience, right? Identifying when and where performance is being degraded is key when optimizing your application. I'll use an example that we're, uh, we've seen uh, several times. So if you're familiar with symphony.com, symphony.com um, is an open source PHP framework. Uh, they are, were able to actually increase their performance of their website and make it three times faster by using Blackfire. Now, please note, symphony.com is a highly optimized website. So it's actually pretty impressive that they were able to do something along those lines and make it even more performant uh, and streamlined. This was easily accomplished by enabling and reviewing Blackfire services monitoring feature with and view the application response time in a few key areas. One, time actually spent in the app's code, getting vis uh, visibility into that. Um, time spent in each service, right? Time spent in a SQL, in HTTP, in queues, Redis, et cetera, um, and list those most impactful services. And then finally, looking into detailed response time per service call and link transactions and profiles. Having this kind of detail on the application was instrumental in one, finding the bottlenecks, and two, measuring the impact of the fix they implemented. With that, the developers actually were able to identify that um, caching uh, one of their SQL queries, and guess what? They used HTTP caching, like we talked about earlier, led to dividing the median response time of the site by three, right? Where was this? The footer. The footer of the site, which contained a dynamic list of blog post categories, which let's be clear, the footer is pretty much on all, if not, is on most, if not all pages, and its values were fetched with an SQL query. So changing the caching of the HTML snippet for a, to a three minute period um, by using ESI, um, this provided a quick solution. If ever the categories were to change, which happened rarely, that would be the maximum duration needed to refresh it. A single query, right? Which was accounting for 60% of the total time spent overall on services. This is a minor change that had a huge impact on performance and giving them those benefits and those increases significantly. So that is from a monitoring perspective and seeing how that's being handled and controlled. Also here, uh, Blackfire provides a profiler, right? Now monitoring is helpful and providing health reports around your application can be very beneficial, but being able to get a visualization of your code that can also help with the understanding of the bigger picture, right? Through detailed insights on how the application consumes system resources, developers can make informed decisions about resource allocation and management. This includes optimizing those database queries, managing network usage, and ensuring efficient use of the file systems. Deep dive into, uh, a deeper dive into the uh, runtime behavior of an application, including how different parts of the application interact, the frequency of duration of method of calls, and the flow of execution, right, directly from the runtime. This knowledge is invaluable for debugging complex issues and understanding the application's architecture. One of our customers, uh, GOG Games, uh, came to us with a few uh, hurdles, and they, by leveraging profile, uh, profiling, they were able to resolve these things. So a few of the hurdles they came up with was the response time of the homepage was significantly higher as much more data was being queried and displayed. The store they had built was working was having a rough time uh, processing the way or, uh, more orders uh, were uh, coming in, and which typically makes sense, right? You have more orders, you need to be able to handle that properly, but how do you measure that? And then the background worker process were actually overheating and the enqueued messaging were piling up, right? So now we have a backlog. Using a profiler, they were actually able to use automated issue detection, right? Which comes included from the get-go and apply recommended best practices across their applications. So before scheduled events that would cause these hurdles, GOG would actually deploy testing Docker containers with Blackfire installed, right? It allowed them to simulate the circumstances of the customers ahead of time and then empowered the developers to not only profile production, but staging and development as well. So now I have the ability to look at these things, make these estimations, get assertions and testing before I've ever gotten to my production environment. So, so going through and making many minor refinements, again, death by a thousand cuts, uh, across the entire stack, they were able to make the checkout, checkout process much faster and scalable. They were able to process 20 more orders simultaneously and consume less resources by using the profiler and using the assert, uh, assertions that were uh, provided with it by default. 
right? They were able to optimize their cash pools, resulting in some rabbit MQ cons uh, consumption to speed up by a factor of almost 10. And then monitor and plan for application behavior by profiling their application during load testing. So again, back in that development and staging environment, I can do all of these tests and see what's going to happen when I get those increased spikes and then adjust my application that way. All these things together, fully integrated seamlessly into their workflow and major CI CD pipelines. An example of this was integrating their performance test suite into their GitLab one, right? Ensuring that no deployment would ship with already identified performance issues, making you a more efficient deployment process and a more efficient application. In the process of optimizing your application, it's important to see the where, the when, and the why of how, to, how your tech stack is functioning. And I hope that a couple of these examples can show you how powerful a tool like this can be. After all, you know, you can't fix what you can't measure. Now, final layer, and that is the application and database layer, right? That is, dun, 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 I know you've all been waiting for it the whole time, Redis, right? So outside of applications internal calculations, fetching data is also an important part of our request usually, right? Your application will likely request data from the database, which stores content somewhere. <laughs> and often this kind of data we will have to be fetched from the database's file system. Compared to other timings before, getting that data might take a while. So what if we could have a way to have commonly requested data available a bit quicker? Well, we can with Redis, which uses in-memory data structure store used as a database, cache, and message broker. Uh, it supports data structures such as strings, hashes, lists, uh, sets, uh, sorted sets, range queries, bitmaps, all of the things, right? So you may ask yourself, you know, how much faster is this? I always think it's funny. How much faster is Redis uh, than your typical hardware? So just to give you an idea, while RAM latency is around 100 to 120 nanoseconds, a solid state drive and hard drives have latencies of around 50 to 150 microseconds and one to 10 milliseconds respectively. By storing all that data in RAM, Redis can retrieve and process data much more quickly than traditional disk-based disk databases. So outside of speed, uh, scalability, uh, Redis easily can scale out to meet growing data demands, right? Ensuring that your application can handle increased load without degradation in performance. And then flexibility. It also supports various data structures, allowing it to handle a wide range of use cases from caching to session management and even real-time analytics. Um, a couple optimization uh, strategies that we would use along those lines is Redis data persistence, right? So we want to use these type of strategies to make uh, Redis more powerful. With data persistence, Redis can make it so that the mechanisms to ensure that data is not even lost even after a server restart, right? Because um, we know that everything's stuck in RAM, you do a restart, you're going to lose it. Well, with uh, persistence, we have the ability to not have to worry about that. Connection pooling, right? This uh, feature optimizes client connection pools directly to Redis, reducing overhead and improving performance. Also minimizing connection establishment and teardown. Redis clustering. This is a big one in today's, uh, uh, today's world, right? This is a built-in feature for distributed Redis setups. It provides automatic sharding and high availability, which is a plus over memcache because that's not available there. And then this also ensures data availability and fault tolerance. Um, finally, in memory, in memory storage, Redis stores data entirely in memory, which provides ultra fast read and write options like we've seen in the example previously against solid state and hard drives. This is suitable for caching in real time applications, but keep in mind with uh, the caveat here, with you know utilizing and putting more things in RAM, you may need to add more RAM. Just keep that in mind, not a big caveat, but from an optimized performance, we want to talk about adding more resources. How are we going to leverage that? You'll probably need more RAM, depending on what you're putting in there in store memory. Far too often do we see applications not leveraging Redis today to its full potential. With Platform Station Upsun, it's actually simple to add a Redis service to your application and start testing this in your de uh, development environment. Then you can see where you can gain the most increases. There's tons of content management systems and frameworks like Drupal, WordPress, even Symfony um, that have built-in integrations that only need a Redis connection to start using this mechanism. So Redis is definitely another piece um, that you want to be able to have in your tool belt. So from the client all the way down to the application and database layer, what have we learned? Let's review. One, become familiar with your projects and how they leverage different layers so that you can find the room to optimize. Like I said at the beginning, you may not need all of them. You may need some of them. You may have already implemented one or two, 
But what I hope that you walk away with is to understand that there are different options and different layers that you can make your application better and maybe something that you're interested to look into or test. Review your HTTP headers. Confirm they're sensibly set, right? Cache control for no cache is your enemy. We want to cache as much as possible. We don't want to not cache unless you're in a specific sector. If you're not using one today, use a CDN, please. They're everywhere. Everybody has a CDN. Um, like I said, even here at Platform SH, we provide a CDN out of the gate. So you right out the get-go, you've already got one. And then implement a data-driven approach to performance optimization. Ask yourself and ask your teams, have you thought about implementing and automating performance tests in your daily workflow? And if not, why? And if, and if you're interested, how? So I hope I was able to provide you guys some insight into how this works, how this functions, um, and throughout the whole process where you can gain some sort of performance um, benefits. Um, and with that, I would uh, kick over to see if there's any questions, concerns, emotional outbursts, anything along those lines. Thank you for the applause. I appreciate that. <laughs> if um, you have any questions, you can feel free to drop them directly in the Q&A or in the chat box. We'll wait just a little bit to see if you have anything, and then we'll be here to answer. Absolutely. Also, um, post this uh, conversation. Um, we'll probably be uh, reaching out to a few of you for some uh, feedback, if possible, just to see if this you found this beneficial. Um, also, what we would like to see is if there's any other subjects or uh, topics that you would be interested in that maybe in this type of webinar format we can kind of address. So stay tuned for that as well, um, and we'll go from there. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions come through, so... Um... I think we're good, but I do appreciate everyone for joining. I, I hope that you uh, enjoyed hearing from Corey. Thank you, Corey, for spending time sharing this with us. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody.